that's a good track right there. Paul Freeman has nothing to prove. See that, it's 13 inches long. But a lot to say. Here's a, see that track right there? Look at that one. About Bigfoot. He must have come run out of here when he heard me coming. On Thursday, August 20th, around 9 a.m., Paul says he drove deep into the Blue Mountains of Northern Oregon to a place called Deduck Springs in the Umatilla National Forest. Well, I just drove up to the pond here, and uh, I know they frequent this area in, in uh, uh, August and September. And I just got out of the, my, my little car and walked around over here, and uh, there was a tracks here in the mud where they I think he was going to get a drink or I don't know maybe he was going to cross there or something but anyway I must have scared him Freeman says he's been searching for the legendary Sasquatch in the woods near the Mill Creek watershed near his Walla Walla home for the last 10 years in October of 1988 his son Dwayne got snapshots in April of this year Paul got video from a distance of around 69 feet this time camera in hand he was a whole lot closer. I started up the bank there and I heard the brush and stuff popping up there. Oh, there he goes. It looked at me once. Jesus. And uh, I kind of got a little nervous and it looked at me and then it turned and just kept on going and it went into the brush there and disappeared and I was looking for it with the camera and. And I seen another one, smaller, is coming at me up there. Oh, God. There's two of them, I guess. After the incident, Freeman says he heard screams from the direction of the creatures that kept him pinned down for almost two hours. Screams he says he did not record. I ain't never been scared like I scared yesterday. <laughs> I never have been afraid of man or beast or anything, but I sat up there yesterday and cowered down like a little kid. Is Bigfoot fact or fiction? I really got upset. Paul Freeman really doesn't care what you think. You know, <laughs> I don't have anything proved to anybody. All he says is that he's seen enough. It's real. That's real, man. In the Blue Mountains of Northern Oregon, John Yeager, News 4, positively northwest and something just told me not to bother him anymore you know and i don't think i will now yeah. introduce who you are and tell us uh, what you do just for the purpose of the tape okay Ready? Yeah. I'm Grover Krantz. I'm a professor of anthropology here at Washington State University. I teach courses in dealing with physical anthropology, introduction to the subject, human evolution, human races, the human skeleton, and sometimes seminars on advanced subjects. Do you feel compelled to still make the case for the existence of Bigfoot? Well, I'm satisfied that this Bigfoot thing exists. Uh, trying to make the case or argue for it on the present evidence is uh, largely uh, futile, but I'd like uh, as much as possible to let the word out as to what I found out and what I'm doing. Tell me, why is it futile? Could you elaborate on that? Almost any scientist will tell you uh, in no uncertain terms that you will prove the existence of the Bigfoot or Sasquatch by bringing in a body or a substantial piece of one. No other evidence is proof. They are adamant about this. And now to that end, uh, there, there's been uh, a lot of controversy in the past about what you've called for. Uh, at one time, you were said to, we've talked about this before, you were going to get in an ultralight helicopter and, uh, and go around and uh, search for one throughout, throughout the woods uh, for a dead body. Remember we talked about that, for a, for a body. Mm -hmm. uh, to that end, finding a body, uh, what's been your position? about this research? Well, my preference certainly would be to find a body of a natural death or one that was uh, already dead for other reasons. <clears throat> but the chance of uh, achieving that 
is so near zero as to be uh, almost silly to pursue it. Nevertheless, I have tried as much as possible. My uh, attempt to um, build and fly an ultralight helicopter and use an infrared imager to locate a decaying body so far has failed. The imager works, but uh, I haven't been able to get the helicopter off the ground. I'm going to make one last attempt later this summer and see what happens. You going to try to get it up with, it, with in the helicopter? I'm going to try to. Um, that, that, that would be fun to be there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> I don't want somebody photographing my bloody body as it's dragged out of the wreckage. <laughs> so you have tried to get, you have tried to... Uh, I've tried to make it go up and it hasn't. Uh -huh. The engines will not go around fast enough and I finally figured out what the problem was. Uh, but then for a couple of years I haven't, or three years now, I haven't had a chance to uh, correct the situation. Mm -hmm. What is your new book about? Tell us about this. Well, I've just finished uh, writing a book. I've titled it Big Footprints which uh, explains um, all of the scientific evidence that relates to the Sasquatch. That is, all of the um, evidence that can be handled in a scientific manner. Now, this is not a uh, listing or description of all the reports of people who have encountered it. This has been well done by John Green and other people in previous publications. But I'm analyzing the footprints, uh, the Patterson film, and other bits of evidence and I'm also trying to, in this book, uh, explain to my scientific colleagues why I take this so seriously. Most of them have no idea of the quantity or quality of information on this. Why do you take this so seriously? Can you boil it down for our purposes? Well, one good reason to uh, take it seriously is the footprints that are available. When you try to consider what are the alternatives, and there's really only two choices when you look at a lot of them, uh, they are either fabricated by a human hoaxer or they are made by the Sasquatch. And when you consider the possibilities and the difficulties and the requirements for a hoaxer to do not some, but all of them, you find you run into an absolutely impossible situation. So the way, it, uh, the way I like to put it is uh, the Sasquatch is ridiculous. The alternative of a hoaxer is impossible. Therefore, the ridiculous must be true. Bigfoot is, fill in the blank. Bigfoot is a large, massive, hairy, bipedal, higher primate. You could describe it as a gigantic man covered with hair and being rather stupid, or an oversized, upright, walking gorilla. And we're talking uh, body sizes of uh, six and a half to eight feet tall, uh, body weights 500 to 800 pounds, covered with hair, incredibly strong, ape-like faces, arms a little bit longer than usual, no constriction at the neck, and you got a fair description. Why has this intrigued you? For how long have you believed that there's something out there? Well, I wouldn't say I believed there was something out there. Unless, well, the term belief usually means an opinion held because it makes you feel good. The first time I ever heard of these things, I think I was about 16 years old, oh, I believed them instantly. But did I think they were real? No, no way. I was here at Washington State University for about two years uh, before I um, finally got hold of some uh, direct information. And that uh, amounted to a pair of footprints. I got, uh, saw some in the um, wild and I got the casts and analyzed them. And the right and left foot were quite unlike each other. They weren't mirror images. One of them was obviously crippled. I analyzed those, and this was back in 1970, and finally decided that the, the design of foot that's implied by the crippling was exactly what you would expect for uh, a creature about eight feet tall and enormously heavy. And I finally decided, if somebody faked that and put all these subtle hints of the anatomy design in that, he had to be a real genius, expert at anatomy, and um, very inventive and original thinking. He had to be outclass me in those areas. And I don't think anybody outclasses me in those areas, at least not since Leonardo da Vinci. And so such a person, I'd say, is impossible. Therefore, the tracks were real. Where does the research on the topic stand? Uh, people have been talking, uh, they've been citing since 1870 throughout the Northwest. I mean, reported, documented Western man since 1870. Uh, where does it stand in 1992, in the, in the early 90s? 
The best summary of where things stand in 1992 is just more of the same. The number of people who are reporting seeing them is just gradually climbing higher and higher. It's over 2,000 now in John Green's reports, and I would doubt that he has more than 1% of them. Uh, he has another 1,000 of uh, footprint accounts. Again, he's got maybe 1% of the observed footprints, and the observed ones couldn't be 1% of the actual ones out there. Um, bits and scraps of other evidence, um, hair samples, bits of blood, uh, other things that they've done to the environment keep being reported and coming in, analyzed. In some cases, these have been dismissed and found to be fake or mistakes. In other cases, they seem to stand, but we don't know what to do with them. I would say the best new evidence that's come in um, in the last even 50 years is really two things, the Patterson film of 1967 and the um, footprints with the clear dermal ridges, like fingerprints, that came in in 1982. We've gotten no more films since then, at least none that are legitimate, though we have gotten a few more footprint casts with uh, dermal ridges. As far as I know, we are no closer to getting a body now than we were 50 or 100 years ago. What about your colleagues? Will they ever embrace the notion of Bigfoot as scientifically significant? And how do you feel, af after answering that, how do you feel with the scorn and the ridicule and the constant uh, belittlement that you've had to undergo by your colleagues? So when will they ever embrace this notion, and how does it make you feel that they've resisted? They're not going to embrace the idea of the existence of the Sasquatch until the definitive evidence comes in. A few of them will uh, accept it when they have done a substantial fraction of the kind of research that I've done. When they've talked to enough people, it, they're going to be convinced that uh, there is no other explanation. But until they do so, and not all my colleagues can do it, uh, there's simply not enough um, time in, uh, in their schedules and uh, they can't reach all the people. Uh, until they do that, they're taking a uh, legitimate skeptical attitude of they want to see the definitive proof, a body or a piece of one. That will convince them instantly. So I don't anticipate uh, convincing anybody on the evidence that I've got. Now, in the meantime, they uh, continue to be, for the most part, skeptical, but there's a substantial number who um, uh, do uh, think it's real, and some who um, take the possibility quite seriously, and they are now feeling a lot more comfortable about that than they were um, 20 years ago, for instance. 20 years ago, this was a taboo subject, and I almost got fired here for um, investigating it and talking openly about it. Now, um, if nothing else, I've got the president of the university supporting me. Now, that doesn't get me any money or any release time or any improvement in salary. I still have to do this entirely on my own, but I've got a good moral support now. The skeptics will always ask, they'll always ask, um, man has been in the Northwest for almost 200 years, settling it for the last hundred, in the forests, along the rivers, in the creeks, um, every summer, you know, making more, more of a foray into the, into the, into the bush, as some people call it, and back into the wilds. Why haven't we found a body yet? Why haven't we found that piece of definitive evidence that will convince people? Well, with all of the human activity over the last two centuries in the Pacific Northwest, I might point out that um, nobody has yet come in with a body of a bear, unless it was killed by human ac action. Uh, the bodies of animals that die a natural death and have the ability to choose their place of dying are notoriously difficult to find. And there's at least a hundred bears out there for every one Sasquatch. So uh, the lack of a body uh, discovered doesn't bother me at all. I, I would be uh, most uh, puzzled if one did come in. I'd want to know, I'd be very suspicious, I'd smell a rat if somebody said they found one. Um, <clears throat> but. According, to, we've talked about this before about Jacko, the uh, the, the ape boy, back mm -hmm. in the what 1920s. Uh, yeah, eight, no, no, 18, 1889. Um, 1884. Okay, um, tell me about that story again. Back in 1884, when the Canadians were just finishing or near finishing their uh, transcontinental railroad, a creature 
was reported found uh, by the railroad crew on the Pacific end, which is well into the Rockies. The creature um, supposedly stood four feet seven inches tall, weighed 127 pounds, which is very heavy set for that height, covered with hair and obviously not human, but uh, walked bipedally. This was a newspaper account and uh, there is uh, practically no follow-up of it. My suspicion is that that creature was taken uh, across, they couldn't take it across Canada at the time, but they could move it down into the United States across the Northern Pacific Railroad that was just completed in that time. And uh, it reached the um, uh, railroad uh, end perhaps at uh, Duluth, Minnesota where uh, Barnum's Circus Men located it. And it was incorporated into Barnum's Circus as Jojo the Dog-Faced Boy. That's my best guess. I think it probably died that season. We have no idea what was done with it, and it was such a hit that they replaced it with the hairiest faced man they could find the next season. Um, but that's, as far as that story goes, that's, that's kind of where it ended right there. I'm afraid that's a dead end. Uh -huh. Yeah. There is one possible follow up on that, and a friend of mine finally managed to do it. Barnum has a circus in uh, Connecticut, uh, one of the places where he uh, headquartered. Uh, uh, has a circus cemetery in Connecticut, and um, a few individuals from the circus, like Tom Thumb, are buried there. So my friend went through the um, cemetery uh, looking at all the headstones to see if he could find a name that was reminiscent of the man in charge of Jacko, or Jacko itself, or Jojo, uh, or anything that might be remotely hinting at it, and he found nothing. Another dead end. Um, what about others in the research field? Uh, you and I have talked about this before, about the acrimony between all of these different individuals. Uh, uh, you and Renee DeHinden, for example, don't see eye to eye at all. Tell me why that happens. We have a problem with um, people in um, the real world who are uh, trying to um, bring in the definitive proof of the Sasquatch. These people uh, are basically all hunters who are trying to um, shoot the first specimen and bring it in. A lot of them will not admit that that's what they're doing, but unless they're pretty stupid, uh, that's exactly what they're after. Now, each of them knows full well that there's going to be some substantial prize for bringing in the first Sasquatch. They also know, uh, if they've given it any thought at all, that the scientific world will immediately take over, and there will not only be no second prize, but if you shoot the second one, you've broken a serious law. So. All these hunters are trying to not only w win that prize, but I think they're spending more time and effort trying to prevent the other guy from getting it than they are trying to do it themselves. Now, those who are really devoted to it, if they really devote their lives to this, all their life is to search for the Sasquatch. That's their only claim to fame. When it is found, they're going to be shoved aside by the scientists and become nothing. They don't want this to happen. They want either the mystery to remain or that they find it. That science ever takes over and shoves them aside is very frightening to them. Now, there are some of these hunters and investigators who are very nervous about me because I may be nudging the scientific world into acceptance. And because of that, they would do anything they can to stop my investigation. Where do you get your casts? It's here? not surprising. Okay. Um, where do you get your, uh, your, your casts and your evidence and that kind of thing? Most of the casts uh, come from uh, when I hear about somebody having found a footprint and making a cast of it, I will go and talk to them and borrow the cast. I will bring it back to my lab, make a um, mold of it, and then return it and a perfect copy to the um, provider. In a few cases, I've uh, made the casts myself uh, when I've been brought to a scene and uh, footprints are there. Maybe the person who found them uh, made his own cast and I might make a few others. Um, tell me about Paul Freeman. Uh, oh, I didn't, I mean, you alluded to Rene before, but... Uh, but I didn't use his name. No. I don't like to do that. Um, what about Paul and his research down at Walla Walla and his, and his hunting? And he's not a scientist. Uh, what, what about, the, do, you, do you lump him into, the, into this category of hunting? Well, 
what kind of creams do you put in his uh, in his work down there? Well, I think Paul Freeman's uh, footprints are probably all legitimate. He's brought in a number of other bits of evidence that uh, are either somebody's hoax, whether it's him or somebody else, it's hard to tell, or um, they're just simply um, undeterminable as to whether they're real or not. He had a photograph once, and now he has a uh, short videotape of one of the creatures. Um, I would be very dubious of his photograph, uh, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if his videotape is real. But it's not definitive, and there's nothing you can do with it to prove it. The people we talk to, and I just want to—I want to balance this out and give you a chance to to respond to what some of the people have said uh, that I that I talk to. Um, I said that if you base your research on some of the things that Paul brings in, and he has a history of admitting faking tracks before, and the Forest Service saying that some of the tracks that he reported were fakes, doesn't that shed light on your credibility? Don't you don't you worry about uh, uh, guilt by association? How does that? How do you respond to that? Well, anybody who brings in fake information uh, does um, shake up the, uh, cast a little doubt on uh, the rest of it. But I just sort of try to learn to live with that. Uh, I look at all the information uh, for what it's worth. Sometimes I get taken in, uh, at least temporarily, by uh, some things. I thought a couple of films of Sasquatches were real until I found out otherwise. A little analysis and hearing stories from other people. Um, with things like uh, Freeman's evidence, yeah, if some of the stuff he brings in is not valid for various reasons, it makes uh, a lot of people worry about uh, the stuff that seems legitimate. Now, I try to draw a sharp line there. Uh, just because uh, some of his uh, information is not valid, that doesn't necessarily throw it all out. I had the same problem 20 years ago with a fellow named Ivan Marks up in northeastern Washington. He uh, faked a film and has since faked many others. But prior to the faking of the film, uh, he uh, brought in a fair number of casts and had a number of accounts of it. And I'm satisfied that all of his evidence up to a certain point was valid. Then he got impatient and started faking films. What pushes somebody over?